نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فكنا في الدين اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته سوره الفرقان the sura was revealed in mecca it has 6 stanzas 77 verses and 25th by the order of arrangement from here the fourth group of the surahs of the quran starts and this group has eight surahs seven of them being revealed in mecca and one that is surah al ahzab which was revealed in mecca and this surah ahzab is a surah which has elaborate commandments The name of the surah is derived from the first verse where Allah says tabarak allazi nazzala alfurqana ala abdihi the time period of the revolution is the same as that of surah mu'minun that is in the somewhat in the middle period of makkah and traditions say that this surah was revealed 8 years before surah nisa The topic and the summary of the surah is that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala has addressed all the doubts and the allegations of the disbelievers. All such queries and accusations they have been logically answered and warning has been given to all those indulging in such a hostility and such oppression. So this is the basic theme uh, theme of the surah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي نزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا الذي له ملك السماوات والارض ولم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك وخلق كل شيء فقدره تقديرا الله سبحانه وتعالى says blessed is he who sent down the criterion upon his servants that he may be to the worlds a warner So at the start of the chapter very comprehensively in one verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is introducing himself his authority his book as furqan and his messenger the purpose of sending prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as li yakuna lil alamina nadira that he may be a warner to the worlds now in this verse is the verse from where the surah gets its name allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called the quran as furqan the root word for furqan is farqaf it means to distinguish to differentiate or to separate so quran means what is a uh, it is a criteria it provides us a cli- criteria where we can clearly very clearly differentiate between what is right what is wrong the truth and the false the halal and the haram the lawful and the unlawful the do's and the don'ts verse number 2 he to whom belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and who has not taken a son and has not had a partner and has created each thing and ha- and determined it with a precise determination so the verse is explaining the first right of allah on all the bondsmen and the first right of allah is that his right uh, is that all the bondsmen should believe in what in the oneness of allah finding no partners with allah 
Verse number three, but they have taken besides him gods which create nothing while they are created and possess not but themselves any harm or benefit and possess not power to cause death or life or resurrection. So uh, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commenting on the state of affairs and there is a comparison of all those who are who were being associated with Allah and uh, they, Allah is comparing all of them with Allah himself that Allah is the creator the rest of all those deities which are associated with Allah they are they have actually been created Allah is the controller whereas they are controlled Allah is the master whereas they are the servants Verse 4, and those who disbelieve say, this Quran is not except a falsehood he invented, and another people assisted him in it, but they have committed an injustice and a lie. <coughs> now the next acquisition of the disbelievers on Prophet and Quran, the most common allegation was, na'uzubillah, that Prophet had fabricated the verses of Quran and Quran according to them was not a divine guidance but a man-made presentation from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and for this you know for this allegation they had a complete story they said that in his childhood when accompanying his uncle Hazrat Abu Talib he met the monk Bahira while uh, the traveling the trade traveling the monk had to told him and the, he had taught him some verses from he, from their scriptures and that is from where he used to get the source for creating the verses which he claims as the verses of quran secondly they said that prophet sallallahu is in touch with some of the slaves of the jews and the christians and he visits them during the night and he learns the verses from the holy books of the Jews and the Christians and alters them and presents them as the verses of Quran in the morning now, Zubillah. And you know what? They used to name some of the slaves also, like Hibr, Balan, Yasar. Many of the names of these slaves were also mentioned. And this was such a pointless allegation because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he did not even know how to read and write. So how could he learn verses of the holy books, which were in another, in a non-Arabic language, in Ibrani, and they were in a foreign language. And then he would, how could he translate and he changed them into Arabic verses overnight? So we do understand now, reciting, relating all this, we do understand that what was the wisdom behind leaving Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Ummi? These allegations had cropped up despite him being not literate. Imagine what would have the, been the state of affairs if he was literate. So remember, there is always some wisdom. There's always some khair in the decision of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And it is because of this accusation that five times in Quran has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged the opponents to make verses like Quran themselves. And but this was because if they had claimed that it was humanly possible, and uh, uh, since last 1400 years, this challenge has been there, and nobody till now has succeeded in completing this challenge. Verse number five, and they say, legends of the former people, which he has written down, and they are dictated to him morning and afternoon. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it has been revealed by he who knows every secret within the heavens and the earth. Indeed, he is ever forgiving and merciful. Verse 7, and they say, what is this messenger that eats food and walks in the markets? Why? Why was there not sent down to him an angel so he would be with him a warner? Now, the criticism here is that he was, a, if he had to be a prophet, why was the prophethood given to a human being? 
or why is not a treasure presented to him from heaven or does he not have a garden from which he eats and the wrongdoers say you follow not but a man affected by magic these are all allegations on prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they always they also used to say that if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to choose a human being as a prophet then why did he not choose any of the leaders of our tribes or give him a wealth or power so that he could go about impressing people or obliging people to con to uh, convince them towards faith and belief look how they strive for you comparisons but they have strayed so they cannot find a way blessed is he who if he willed could have made you something better than that gardens beneath which rivers flow and could make for you palaces but they have denied the hour and we have prepared for those who deny the hour a blaze which blaze the blaze of hell fire so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the basic reason behind all the allegations that the disbelievers were making against prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the basic reason which allah explains is that they do not believe in her after and they do not have any fear of her after because you know when there is no fear of punishment there is no fear of the punishment of her after then only will people tend to talk loose and then only will they disbelieve and so to threat them the punishment of her after has been mentioned here as the hour of blaze when the hell fire sees them from a distant place they will hear its fury and roaring allah then in verse number 12 to 14 narrates how all those who criticized prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and held false accusations against him they will behave after seeing or being thrown in hell fire and when they are thrown into a narrow place they are in bound in chains they will cry out they are upon for destruction they will be told do not cry this day for one destruction but cry for much destruction <coughs> verse number 15 say is that better that is the punishment which has been mentioned in verse 12 to 14 is that better or the gardens of eternity which is promised to the righteous it will be for them a reward and a destination so the verse is making minds think verse 16 for them their end is whatever they wish while abiding eternally it is ever upon your lord a promise worthy to be requested so many times so many times mentioning the the bounties of jannah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has comprehensively mentioned lahum ma yashaun rather than separately mentioning the various bounties allah comprehensively mentions that for all the inmates of jannah they will be they will be rewarded with whatever they would desire because you know uh, various minds will be attracted to various blessings so a uh, general comment that everybody will get whatever they will desire and mention the day he will gather them and that and that which they worship besides allah and will say did you mislead these my servants or did they themselves stray from the way they will say exalted are you it was not for us to take besides you any allies but you provided comforts for them and their fathers until they forgot the message and became a people ruined so they will deny you disbelievers in what you say and you cannot avert punishment or find help and whoever commits injustice among you we will make him taste a great punishment and we did not send before you any of the messengers except that they ate food and walked in the markets and we have made some of few people as a trial for others will you have patience and ever is your lord seeing 
and those who do not expect the meeting with us say, why were not angels sent down to us? Or why do we not see our Lord? They have certainly become arrogant within themselves and become insolent with great insolence. Verse 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers their criticism. The day they see the angels, no good tiding will there be that day for the criminals. And the angels will say, prevented and inaccessible. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning what? That they asked that why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send angels? So Allah is answering that if the prophets had been sent as angels, then after the arrival of angels, there is either death or there is torment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they would have perished. Verse 23, and we will regard what they have done of deeds and make them as dust dispersed. So the result of disbelief and doubt and opposition of Prophet Sallallahu and Quran, that all the deeds will be wasted. Like how? Haba Mansura, they will be, they will be blown away like a dispersed dust. The companions of paradise that day are in a better settlement and a better resting place and mention the day when the heaven will split open with emerging clouds and the angels will be set down in successive descent. True sovereignty that day is for the most merciful and it will be upon the disbelievers a difficult day. Now, here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that on the day of judgment, the sovereignty will just be for Allah Almighty. The traditions clearly explain that on the day of resurrection, when everything in the universe will perish by the orders of Allah, by the order of Allah, the sun and the earth, they will be as balls and they will be revolving in the hands of when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be in his throne, almighty Allah, rotating the sun and the earth in his hands, on his throne, he will, he will announce, Ain al-jabbaroon, Ain al-mutakabbiroon, where are the oppressors, where are the arrogance? And then it will be asked, Liman al-mulk, who is, for whom is the authority of today? There will be total silence. And even Allah in Quran has mentioned that the answer will be, Lillahi al-wahid al-qahar. Remember how in this world, in full blown arrogance, and people oppress all those who are dependent on them, or all those who are weaker in them, how people take these worldly possessions and properties as simply as their own, something that this house, this house is mine. Because on a simple piece of paper, it has been transferred on my name. And then an arrogant and a pompous mother-in-law, she just thinks that this is my house. So my policy, my system, my dictations, haven't we seen, haven't we seen the systems change? Authorities shift, leaving our houses, our properties to our children, our heirs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from arrogance and any form of oppression and bless us the ability to be humble to Allah and to be humble to all the, all the bondsmen of Allah also. And the day the wrongdoers will bite on his hands in regret and he will say, oh, wish, oh, I wish I had taken with the messengers away. Oh, woe to me. I wish I had not taken that one as a friend. So on the day of judgment for taking certain people or certain companions, on the day of judgment, people will have regrets regarding their friendships also. Prophet Sallallahu has said, Al Maru ala dini khalilihi. A man is at the religion of his friend. And Prophet Sallallahu has explained that example of a good friend 
which we should all try to take. The example of a good friend is like a person selling scent. This person who is selling scent will do what? Either he will give some scent as a gift or <clears throat> the person who is sitting close to this person will, will, will get what? Will smell the wonderful scent or will at least gather some of the aroma of the scent at least. And Hazrat Isa alayhi salam used to say that make friends with a person with whom, sitting with whom will remind, will remind you of Allah. And he will say, regretting why he made certain companions and why he made certain friends, the person, on the, the inmate of hellfire, he will say, my friend, he led me away from the remembrance after it had come to me and ever is shaitan to man a deserter. And the messenger has said, oh my Lord, indeed, my people have taken this Quran as a thing abandoned. So the verse highlights a complaint which will be launched by Prophet ﷺ regarding the Quran. Now, if we statistically analyze current state of affairs in the Ummah, we will, we will clearly realize that not even 10% of the people of the Ummah recite Quran daily. And out of these, an even smaller fraction goes through the translation and the messages of Quran. And among these, even a minutest of the fractions comprehends, believes, obeys the messages of Quran. So that is exactly why Prophet ﷺ will launch a complaint against all those from the Ummah. And this will be presented on the day of resurrection. And thus we have made for every prophet an enemy from among the criminals, but sufficient is your Lord as a guide and a helper. And those who disbelieve say, why was the Quran not revealed to him all at once? Thus it is that we may strengthen thereby your heart and we have spaced it distinctive, distinctly. Another criticism, why wasn't the Quran revealed in a single sitting? Because, you know, they used to say that since Prophet Sallallahu fabricates it himself, Nazubillah, that is why it comes in pieces. If Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala had revealed it, he could have, and he in fact would have sent it down in one sitting. Now, we know that Quran was slowly and steadily revealed over 23 years. Why was this so? Many reasons which we learn, the first being since the process of revelation of Quran, it imposed a great burden on Prophet Sallallahu So for his convenience, Quran was revealed slowly and steadily. Secondly, it was difficult reciting and teaching and getting it written down after the revolution. It was difficult for Prophet as well as for the companions to write it down. So for the ease of Prophet and for the convenience of the companions also, it was revealed slowly and steadily. And then um, we also know that if all the revolution, they had come just once, then teaching and making them understand and memorizing would have been like next to impossible. Moreover, the commandments were given slowly and steadily and stepwise to make the training and changing and transforming of the individuals and the society easy and possible also. Because radical and sudden and social if the orders which were radical and they had come suddenly, all of a sudden, then the social and the psychological and the emotional, cultural, ethical transformation was impossible. And even if such uh, revolutionary change did occur, it would have been short-lived. Because like we can relate, we can relate very clearly that uh, an example of rain, that when it is when there is a light shower of rain, it is completely and quickly absorbed in the soil. Whereas on, 
On the contrary, if there is a heavy downpour, the water flows, most of the water of the rain, it flows creating a slippery slush. So rather than being beneficial, it becomes slightly, uh, uh, it slightly becomes problematic. Another reason for the slow revelations of Quran was that there was uh, continuous and there was an off and on consoling for the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions, it was needed. Similarly, continuous threats to the opposition, to those who were opposing, these continuous threats and warnings were also needed. And then to answer the questions and the queries which were put forward by the disbelievers also, the verses had to be continuously, slowly and steadily revealed. And to refute the false allegations which kept on cropping every now and then, also the verses had to be revealed. And uh, to comment on the situations, the verses were also continuously revealed to comment on the situations, on the events, on the battles which were taking place in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is why starting from Ikra, Bismi Rabbika Lazi Khalaq, to Al Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Dinukum of Surah Al Maida, it took full 23 years for the complete revelation of Quran. And they do not come to you with an argument except that we bring you the truth and the best explanations. The ones who are gathered on their faces to hell, these are the worst in position and farthest astray in their way. Allahumma ihdina sirat al mustaqeem. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Verse number 35, and we had certainly given Musa alayhi salam the scripture and appointed with him his brother Harun as an assistant. And we said, go both of you to the people who have denied our signs. Then we destroyed them with complete destruction. And the people of Nu alayhi salam, when they denied the messengers, we drowned them and we made them for mankind a sign. And we have prepared for the wrongdoers a painful punishment. In verses number 35 to 43, now Allah is narrating some of the events in the lives of the previous, previous prophets. And the purpose is to highlight that uh, their opposition and all the people in their life who had not believed also had similar behavior and they were also fun, uh, followed by severe punishment. And the purpose is to warn the opponents of Prophet Sallallahu and to console the companions. And we destroyed Ad and Samud and the companions of the well and many generations between them. And for each, we presented examples as warnings and each we destroyed with total destruction. And they have already come upon the town, which was showered with the rain of evil, which nation, the people of Lut. So have they not seen it, but they are not expecting resurrection. And when they see you, they take you not except in ridicule saying, is this the one whom Allah has sent as a messenger? He almost would have misled us from our gods had we not been steadfast in worship of them. But they are going to know when they see the punishment who is farthest astray in his way. Have you seen the one who takes as his God his own desires? Then would you be responsible for him? So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning something which more than once has Allah talked in the Quran. In another chapter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the example of a person who makes his desire as his God is like a dog, a dog who is the slave of his desires. Now, how is it that a person can make his desires as his God. What is the right of God? What is the right, the first right of Allah on the bondsman is taking him as a master, obeying him as his servants. So, you know, if a person starts following and starts obeying his desires instead of obeying the orders, the do's and don'ts of Allah, it means what? Giving the right of obedience instead of Allah 
has given the right of obedience to his soul, to his desires. And this is exactly what means us taking his desire as God. Now, giving a few examples, for example, the desires would, would want what? The person would desire to have fun and to drink and to gamble and to have free sex. But Allah makes all these things unlawful and Allah very strictly prohibits all these things. Now, following the desires and disobeying Allah would mean that the person has taken his desires as his God. Similarly, the desire might be saying, dress up and dance and dirt, dating around and flirting around. So the desire wanting dancing and dating and flirting, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says no to all. Now the person does as he desires. The person does as he desires, lifetime, fun time. So what is he doing? Making his desires as his God. Now the desire, the desires of the person dictate that the woman should be wearing revealing and fitting and transparent dresses, vulgar dresses, wearing perfumes and makeups and jingling all forms of ornaments. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered in Surah Nur and in Surah Ahzab and in Surah Araf. But the person does as he desires. And this is what? This is making his desires as his God. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us a supplication to help us prevent ourselves from this evil manner and behavior. Allahumma alhimna rushtan wa aizna min shururi an pusina. Allahumma rahmatika arju fala takilni ila nafsi min tarfata aynin wa aslihli shakni kullahu la ilaha illa anta. Ya muqallib al-qulubi sabbit qalbi ala dinik. Ya musarrif al-qulubi swarrif qalbi ala tu'atik. Or do you think that most of them hear or reason? They are not except like by livestock. Rather, they are even more astray in their way. Have you not considered your Lord, how he extends the shadow? And if he willed, he could have made it stationary. Then we made the sun for it an indication. Then we hold it in hand for a brief grasp. And it is he who has made the night for you as a clothing and sleep as a mean for rest and has made the day a resurrection. And it is he who sends the wind as good tidings before his mercy. And we send down from the sky pure water that we may bring to life thereby a dead land and give it as a drink to those we created of numerous livestock and the men and we have certainly distributed it among them that they may they might be reminded but most of the people refuse except disbelief and if we had willed, we could have sent into every city a warner. So do not obey the disbelievers and strive against them with the Quran, a great striving. Now, in this verse 52, we get basically two messages. Allah says, Wajahid hum bihi jihadan kabira. He here ref, uh, refers to the Quran. So the first message we get is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering all of us, the Muslims of the Ummah of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that whenever they will make jihad in the path of Allah, the jihad will be according to the rules and the regulations decided by the Quran itself. And the second meaning is that Allah says that do what? doing or spending time or indulging in the teachings of Quran and the preaching of Quran and the implementation of Quran, all those activities are itself what? They are jihadan kabiran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us strive and struggle for this jihadan kabiran. Verse number 53, and it is he who has released simultaneously the two seas, one fresh and sweet and one salty and bitter. He placed between them a barrier, 
a prohibiting partition. What is this? Now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining one of his miracles, the miracles where the river falls in the sea. We know that the water of the river is muddy and it is brown in color, but it is fresh, sweet, and cold. Whereas as compared to that, the water of the sea is warm, it is salty, clear, and blue. Now at the estuary, the place where the river falls in the sea, the two stay distinctly separate entities. And you know what? Even the plants and the aquatic animals which are in them, they are also entirely different and they tend to stay in their own zones. Subhanallah. And the aerial view, the aerial view from an aeroplane, from a flight is like spectacular. We can see the clear blue area of the sea water demarcated on either sides of a triangular brownish river water. And there is no mixing up. And there is no mixing up. This is all what? This, these are the signs and the miracles of Allah. And explaining this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains and guides us regarding a condition of our normal daily activities. Verse 54, Allah says, and it is he who has created from water human being and made him a relative by lineage and marriage. And ever is your Lord competent concerning creation. So Allah explaining the matter of the two, uh, of the river and the sea, and they yet saying separate, very much similar to the example of the two waters, similar and yet different and distinct. Both types of waters, they are basically similar, and yet they are different and distinct. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his bondsmen has created two types of relationships in his family. The first is his family lineage and the second is his in-laws. So that is what the verses are explaining is that we need to realize how, how similar we have to be in the respect, in the love, care and regard. But for both the categories, we have to maintain separate relations and bonds also, like dealing with the mother-in-law and with the father, uh, with the mother and the mother-in-law, with the father and the father-in-law has to be similar, yet distinctively different also. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us, spend our lives in moderation and in obedience. But they worship rather than Allah, which does not benefit them or harm them. And the disbeliever is ever against his Lord and assistant to shaitan. And we have not seen sent you except as a bringer of good tidings and a warner. Say, I do not ask, uh, ask of you for it any payment, only that whoever wills might take to his Lord away and rely upon the ever living who does not die and exalt Allah with his praise and sufficient is he to be with the sins of his servants acquainted. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. He who created the heavens and the earth and what is between them in six days and then established himself above the throne, the most merciful. So ask about him, one well informed. And when it is said to them, prostrate to the most merciful, they say, and what is the most merciful? Should we prostrate to that which you order us and increases them in aversion? Blessed is he who has placed in the sky great stars and placed therein a burning lamp and a luminous moon. And it is he who has made the night and the day in succession for whoever desires to remember or desires gratitude and the servants of the most merciful, the Ibadur Rahman, the servants of the most merciful are those who walk upon the earth easily. And when the ignorant address them harshly, they say, 
words of peace. Now here in the last few verses of Surah Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning and is talking about whom? Ibadur Rahman, the servants of the Rahman, the most merciful. Now I would here revise what I mentioned previously in Surah Al-Fatiha. The difference between Rahman and Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a Rahman and he is a Rahim. Allah is Rahman in this world with his mercy, which is common for all. But on the day of judgment, he will no longer be Rahman. He will be Rahim, whose mercy will be not common, will be specific. And specific for whom? It will be specific for those who, after receiving the blessings and bounties of the Rahman, they still stayed grateful and obedient to the merciful Rahman Rab. So Rahim will be merciful for those who will be the obedient servants of the Rahman, not of the Shaitan. So if we want to be showered with the mercy of the Rahim Rab on the day of judgment, we need to remember and we need to learn and we need to adopt these manners of the Ibadur Rahman. <coughs> So the traits and the manners and the behaviors of the Ibadur Rahman are, number one, who walk upon the earth easily. So the first trait is humbleness. They, they walk as a humble servant. They do not walk like arrogant, proud, vain, pompous people. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also ordered in Surah Luqman, Wala tamshi fil arzi marha. And Allah says, Wala tusa'ir nas. Don't turn your faces towards people and don't walk in the earth arrogantly and proudly. And then the next thing what they do is that when ignorant people come up to them and ignorant people are harsh to them or ill-mannered to them, then what do they say? Salamun alaykum. They are what? They, they just stay away from them. They ignore their harsh behavior and they are what? They are forgiving and they are, they are kind. This is what? This is self-control. This is patience, tolerance, forgiveness, and open-mindedness of the Ibadur Rahman. And the next is, and those who spent a part of the night to their Lord, prostrating and standing in prayer. This is the activities of the midnight of how the Ibadur Rahman, they are busy in their Salatul Tahajjud. And those who say, our Lord, avert from us the punishment of hell. Indeed, its punishment is ever adhering. Indeed, it is evil as a settlement and residence. So this is what they make supplicants, supplication to be released or to be saved from the torments of hellfire. Their supplication is, And they are those who, when they spend, do so not excessively or sparingly, but are ever between that, between that justly moderate. So they do what? Moderation in spending, as Prophet Sallallahu said, Khairul Amuri Ausatiha, the best of manner is in moderation. And those who do not invoke with other, with Allah, another deity, or kill the soul which Allah has forbidden to be killed, except by right, and do not commit unlawful sexual intercourse, and whoever should do that will meet a penalty. Multiplied for him is the punishment on the day of resurrection, and he will abide therein, humiliated, except for those who repent, believe, and do righteous work. For them, Allah will replace their evil deeds with good, and ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al So, the Ibadur Rahman, they do not find partners, they do not kill, except when they are Committed and they do not do what? They do not commit in any form of adultery. So 
He who repents and does righteous, uh, righteousness does indeed turn to Allah with accepted repentance. And they are those who do not testify to falsehood. And when they pass near ill speech, they pass by dignity. And those, when reminded of the verses of their Lord, do not fall upon them deaf and blinded. And those who say, Rabbana hablana min azwajina, O Lord, grant us from among our wives and offsprings comfort to our eyes and make us an example for the righteous. So the Ibadur Rahman, you see, they very, very frequently are found supplicating to the Rahman Rab. Because they know that Rahman is the merciful and he will listen to their supplications. He will accept and he will grant their supplications because in the dua will ibadah. They know that supplication itself is the worship of the Ibadur Rahman, of the, of the Rahman Rab. And they know that the Rahman Rab is pleased the rahim rab is pleased when they make the supplication and they know that the rahman rab gets furious gets angry when a bondsman doesn't supplicate so they supplicate very frequently and here they are found supplicating not just for themselves for them to be relieved or to be saved from the hellfire they are also supplicating for their children for their spouses so they are fearing hellfire, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ko anfusukum wa ahlikum nara. Just don't go about working and striving and struggling to save yourselves from hellfire. You work and you make effort to save your family members, your spouses, your, your children from hellfire also, so that all of you can be gathered together as inmates of Jannah. So they supplicate for their, for their wives, for their husbands, and also for their children. And what do they supplicate for? This shows what are they fearing? They fear hereafter. They fear the torments of hellfire. And they are what? They want to be the God-fearing. They want to be the pious Ibadur Rahman. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-khuda wal-tuqa wal-afafa wal ghina those will be awarded the chambers for what they patiently endured and they will be received their end with greetings and words of peace abiding eternally their end good is the settlement and good and the best is the residence say would my lord care for you if not for your supplication for you disbelievers have denied so your denial is going to be adherent allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us god help us and bless us with fear of hereafter and help us and guide us to be among those who are the Ibadur Rahman, help us and guide us to be those of whom are preparing for the eternal abode. Help us to remember the life hereafter. Help us to plan and spend for it and to prepare for it. Allah, accept from us all, all our major and minor good deeds and forgive us all, all our major and minor sins. Sura Ashura. Sura Ashura was revealed in Makkah and it has 227 verses and 11 stanzas and 26 by the order of arrangement. It is the second surah of the fourth group and the name of the surah derives from the verse 224 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned about the poets. The shu'ara, shu'ara means the plural for shair. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he talks about the poets being misguided. The time period of the surah is being explained as the chronological order of revelation is surah vakya, followed by Surah Shu'ara and then Surah Tawha. It had been revealed before Hazrat Umar and who had embraced Islam. 
The main topics and the theme of the surah is that the chapter was revealed in the background that the obstinate disbelievers, they were responding, they were obstinately disbelieving and they were obstinately responding to the invitations of uh, Prophet ﷺ by refusal, rejection and criticism. And Prophet ﷺ was consoled and he was told not to be upset for the sake of the disobedience and the disobedience were answered and they were warned and uh, they were warned by the punishment all disobedience will be given on the day of the judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, starts, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Tawseen Meem, Tilka Ayatul Kitabil Mubeen, La Alla Kabahiyun Nafsaka, Allah Yakunu Mu'mineen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, Tawseen Meem, these are the verses of the clear book. Perhaps, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you would kill yourself with grief that they will not be believers. The verse highlights us of the cause of grief for Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was grieved when he saw that the people around him they were going astray. He was grieved by seeing people being misguided and, and stubbornly still continuing on disbelief despite being invited. He was grieved for the fear of punishments and torment and torment for a torments of Allah falling on the people. So just let's stop here and compare. What do we get upset about? What are we anxious about? What do we grieve about? Remember, generally in this world, common causes of grief and getting upset are generally, generally regarding our worldly issues. Generally women getting upset, men and women generally getting upset that we don't have our own house, our personal own house. And then if they have a house, they are grieved that we have a house which is very small, and if they have a big house, the next grief and sorrow and tension is that the locality is not nice. We don't live in a posh locality, in an elitist locality. And then if the house is in a posh locality, the next sorrow and the tension is that we have a house which is very old and the fittings and the furnishings are not latest and imported. And if everything is latest and imported, then the next thing is that all the furniture is all obsolete and outdated, and so on and so forth. A woman is generally found grieved and upset and getting anxious and tense. I don't have a new dress for the wedding of my niece. And if she has a dress, the dress is used. It is seen. Uh, my friends and all my relatives have seen me wearing this. And if she happens to have a new dress, then the next dress is it's not a designer dress. And if she has a designer dress, the next tension and the depression is that she doesn't have a matching handbag or a matching shoe. Women being grieved and upset that she doesn't have a solitaire in her ring or that her sister has a bigger house. So all the sorrows and all the tensions and all the grievings are on what? regarding the worldly positions we do not have. Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba man yuhibbuka wa amal allazi yuballighuni hubbaka. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. And if we willed, we could send down to them from the sky a sign for which their necks would remain humbled and no revelation comes to them anew from the most merciful except the turn away from it. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum for they have already denied but there will come to them the news of that they which the uh, news of that which they used to ridicule. Did they not look at the earth? 
how much we have produced therein from every noble kind. Indeed, in that is a sign, but most of them were not to be believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is the exalted in might and merciful. And mentioned when your Lord called Musa alayhi salam, saying, go to the wrongdoing people, the people of Pharaoh, will they not fear Allah? From here is starting the narration of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam's event once again. He said, my Lord, indeed, I fear, I fear that they will deny me and that my breast will tighten and my tongue will not be fluent. So sent for Harun and they have upon me a claim due to sin, which when Hazrat uh, Musa alayhi salam had unintentionally murdered a person. They have, they, uh, they have upon me a claim due to sin, so I fear that they, kill, they will kill me. Allah said, no, go both of you with our signs. Indeed, we are with you listening. Go to Pharaoh and say, we are the messengers of the Lord of the worlds, commanded to say, send with us the children of Israel. Verse 18, Pharaoh said, did we not raise you among us a child and you remained among us for years of your life? So Pharaoh was reminding Hazrat Musa salam, of his kindness in childhood. And then you did your deed, which you did, and you were of the ungrateful. Musa salam, said, I did it then while I was those of astray, so I fled from you. When I feared you, then my Lord granted me wisdom and prophethood and appointed me as one of the messengers. And is this a favor of which you reminded me that you have enslaved the children of Israel? said Pharaoh, and what is the Lord of the worlds? Musa salam said, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, and that between them, if you should be convinced. Pharaoh said to those around him, do you not hear? Musa salam said, your Lord and the Lord of your first forefathers. Pharaoh said, indeed, your messenger who has been sent to you is mad. Musa salam said, Lord of the East and West, that between them, if you were to reason, Pharaoh said, if you take a God other than me, I will surely place you among those imprisoned. Musa salam said, even if I brought you proofs manifest, Pharaoh said, then bring it if you should be of the truthful. So Musa salam threw his staff and suddenly it was a serpent manifest and he drew out his hand. Thereupon it was white for the observers. Pharaoh said to the eminent ones around him, indeed, this is a learned magician. He wants to drive you out of your land by his magic. So what do you advise? They said, postpone the matter of him and his brother and send among the city gatherers who will bring you every learned skilled magician. So the magicians were assembled for the appointment of a well-known day. And it was said to the people, will you congregate? that we might follow the magicians if they are the predominant. And when the magicians arrived, they said to Pharaoh, is there indeed for us a reward if we were the predominant? He said, yes, and indeed you will be then of those near to me. So he offered them power, authority, and wealth. Musa salam said to them, throw whatever you will throw. So they threw their ropes and their staffs and said, by the might of Pharaoh, indeed it is we who are the predominant. <coughs> then Musa salam threw his staff and at once it devoured what they had falsified. So the magicians fell down in prostration to Allah. They said, we have believed in the Lord of the worlds, the Lord of Musa and Harun. Pharaoh said, you believed Musa before I gave you the permission? This was his 
arrogance. He thought that all people needed to do what? What he permitted, that he thought that in his, in his land, what would, what would be implemented was his commandments, his orders, his laws, and his do's and don'ts. Indeed, he is your leader who has taught you magic, but you are going to know, I will surely cut off your hands and your feet on opposite sides, and I will surely crucify you all. He was trying to thread them to get them reverted. They said, no harm. Indeed, to our Lord, we will return. Indeed, we aspire that our Lord will forgive us and our sins we, because we were the first to believe and we inspired to Musa alayhi salam, travel by night with my servants. Indeed, you will be pursued. Now from here, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the part of the story I have not uh, talked about or discussed in detail. What happened was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. And the order was what? Asri. Travel by night. Overnight migration was ordered to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. And Hazrat Musa alayhi salam was asked to carry on the whole process of immigration totally secretly was ordered to do and conduct the whole of the process of migration from Egypt totally secretly because the Bani Israel were what? They were the slave nation. And if the Kipti masters, they happen to find out about their plan of immigration, they would obviously stop them from doing so. So this was an order of Allah to Bani Israel. And they obeyed, they obeyed with a remarkable obedience. Just imagine overnight migration at such a massive scale. It was no easy job. First of all, passing the order of, the, of Allah and order of Prophet themselves itself, it was uh, a very difficult job with the limited means of communication of those days. It must have been a colossal job. Then after that, shifting out with such a massive population, maintaining secrecy, this needed remarkable obedience and disciplines and organization and organized planning and even much more. But the whole process was conducted smoothly and as they were ordered. And when they left Egypt, they were followed by... <coughs> by the uh, by pharaoh and his armies but what happened is that when they followed and they obeyed the teachings of allah and hazrat musa alayhi salam showing such immense obedience and reliance then according to the rule of allah in allah the help of allah came and the help of allah came as a miracle which has been now related in verse number 53 to, 50, uh, to 60. Uh, Allah inspired Musa alayhi salam to travel by the night with my servants. Indeed, you will be pursued. Then Pharaoh sent among the city gatherers that when they got up in the morning and they found out that all the slave nation they had left, then Pharaoh sent for the whole army to be gathered and sent. Indeed, those are but a small band. And indeed, they are enraging us. And indeed, we are a cautious society. So Pharaoh was, um, he was greatly enraged and he was furious. And all of them, Pharaoh and his army, they came out and they were pursuing the people of Bani Israel. So we removed them from the gardens and springs and the treasures and honorable stations. Thus, we caused to inherit it, the Christian, uh, the children of Israel. So they pursued them at sunrise. And when the two, the two companies saw one another, the companions of Musa Islam said, indeed, we are to be overtaken. So when the people of Bani Israel, they saw the armies, they got anxious. And when Musa Islam, he said, what? No, indeed, with me is my Lord. He will guide me. The people, they were, obviously, they, they got anxious. But the prophet, 
who had stronger faith, who had a stronger belief in Allah, was totally relying and was confident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect and guide him. Remember that one who has reliance and one who has faith on the powers of Allah surely receives the help of Allah. And he who believes that Allah will guide, that Allah guides him. And he who is sure that Allah will help, Allah does help him. Verse 63, then we inspired to Musa, strike with your staff the sea and it parted and each portion was like a great towering mountain and we advanced there to the pursuers and we saved Musa salam, and those with him all together and then we drowned the others indeed and that is a sign but most of them were not to be believers <coughs> and indeed your lord he is the exalted in might and merciful and recite to them the news of Ibrahim salam, when he said to his father and his people what do you worship now, from here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be reciting a brief narration of uh, Hazrat uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam that when he recognized Allah and he developed faith in the oneness of Allah, he didn't keep it to himself. He didn't keep it to himself. Instead, he invited others. And the verses um, in the following verses from verse number 78 to 82, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is narrating the dialogue between Ibrahim alayhi salam and his people. He asked them what they worship. And they said, we worship idols and we remain to them devoted. He said, do they, do they hear you when you supplicate or do they benefit you or do they harm? They said, but we found our fathers doing this. He said, then do you see what you have been worshipping, you and your ancient forefathers? Indeed, they are enemies to me, except the Lord of the worlds who created me. And he, it is who guides me. It is he who feeds me and gives me drinks. And when I am ill, it is he who cures me and who will cause me to die and then bring me to life and who I aspire, he will forgive me my sins on the day of recompense. So here, Hazrat Ibrahim salam explained, <coughs> Hazrat Ibrahim salam explained how he recognizes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes. Allah, his creator, did not leave he, the creator, he does not leave his bondsmen after creating them, but he guides them. He who is Al-Hadi, he guides the bondsmen after creating them. He who is the provider, he who is Ar-Razak, he provides for his creation and he is Rabbul Alameen, he is the sustainer. And he who is the Ashafi. He, when he inflicts and when he gives illness, then he also, the Ashafi, he cures his bondsmen. And he who creates is also the Al Hayyul Qayyum. He gives life and he gives death and he will resurrect on the day of resurrection. And he who is Al Ghafur, who is Al Ghafar, and he forgives all his bondsmen here and for hereafter. And he said, my Lord, grant me authority and join me with the righteous and grant me a repetition of honor among later generations and place me among the inheritors of the gardens of pleasure and forgive my father. Indeed, he has been of those astray and do not disgrace me on the day they are all resurrected, the day when they will not benefit anyone, the wealth or children, but only one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. Heart. and paradise will be brought near that day to the righteous so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this verse number 20 a uh, verse number 90 that the paradise will be brought close to whom will be brought close on the day of resurrection to those who are the righteous those who are the pious as Allah says also in Quran, 
that the Jannah is prepared for whom? Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared only for those who are God-fearing, who are pious, who have piety and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the merit and this is the excellence and this is the reward of piety and the fear of Allah. What do we mean by the fear of Allah? The fear of Allah means the fear of the questions of Allah on the day of judgment, fear of the punishments of Allah on the day of judgment, fear of the accountability of Malik Yom Middin, fear of standing before him, fear of facing him when he will say, You've come all by yourself the way I created you the day you were born. The fear of the wrath of Allah, the fear of his hellfire, the fear of being deprived of Jannah, the fear of this player of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what taqwa means. This is what fear of Allah means. This is what piety is. And how excellent piety and fear of Allah is, Allah says, in Allah, you hibbul muttaqin. There is absolutely no doubt that He loves all those who are fearing Allah. Then Allah says, In Allah, ma'al muttaqin. Allah will be with all those who are God fearing. Allah says, In al muttaqin, mafaza. There is absolutely no doubt that all those who are God fearing will be successful, successful hereafter. Well, aqibatulil muttaqin, the best reward, the best result of success of hereafter will be for all those who are pious and God fearing. And Allah says, Waliman khafa maqama rabbihi jannatan, for the person who feared to stand before Allah, who will fear to stand before Allah Malik Yom on the day of resurrection, there will be the gardens of Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that the person who fears to stand before him will be rewarded as Jannah. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been reported in a tradition to tell all of us that no one will budge an inch. No person on the day of judgment standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will budge an inch until, unless he answers five questions. The fear of answering these questions is what taqwa is, what piety and fear of Allah is. So no person will budge an inch until unless he answers five questions. The first being, how did you spend your youth? How did you go about your youth? What did you see? What did you hear? How did you talk? What did you talk about? How did you walk? What did you wear? How did you behave and relate with the opposite sex? Okay, fine. Youth, you had desires. You were tempted. You had temptations. They were difficult to resist. There was lack of knowledge in your life. You did not have experiences of life. So, okay, fine with you. The next question, how did you spend the rest of your life? Some were blessed with 80 years. Some were blessed with 95 years. How did you spend the rest of your life after your youth? Did you, did you do self-accountability? Did you repent? Did you confess? Did you cry out to seek forgiveness? Because Ur was to human. You erred. But did you seek forgiveness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what you had done in your youth of which you were committing in the rest of your life? Then the third question, how did you earn your wealth? Was it lawful? Was it halal? Was it permissible? And then the fourth question, how did you spend your earnings? How did you spend all your wealth, your earnings to show off, to exhibit, to demonstrate for Riyadh? Wastefully, miserly, or within or without the limits of Allah? And the last but not the least, the fifth question, how much did you act upon the knowledge that you were blessed 
the knowledge of Quran, the knowledge of Hadith, the knowledge of the Sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu the knowledge you were blessed, how much did you act upon it? Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafiyan, rizqan tuayyiban, wa amalam mutakabbala. Allahumma anfa'ni bima allamtani wa allimni ma yanfa'uni wa zidni ilma. And this is fear of Allah. Allah has promised. Allah has promised Jannah for those fearful of Allah. Allah says in Surah Al Imran, "Sariu ila jannatin wa maghfiratin min Rabbikum wa jannatin arzuha samawati wal arz aiddat lil muttaqin." Jannah, which has been prepared only for those who are God fearing. And Allah says, "Ya yuhalazina amanu taqullah." O oh, all those who believe, O oh, the believers do what? Fear Allah. How do you fear Allah? As is the right to fear Allah. What is haqqatuqatihi? What is the right of fearing of Allah is that the fear of Allah should be, should be more than fear of anyone on this world. The fear to displease Allah the fear of the displayer of Allah should be more than the fear to displease the spouse, the children, and the family. The fear of the questions of Allah on the day of resurrection, the fears of the accountability of Allah on the day of judgment should be more than the fear of the questions of the friends, of the community. That is the peer pressure. The desire to please Allah should be more than the desire to please or, the, or impress our relatives, our community, or all those around us. So this is the flair of Allah. Where, where does taqwa reside? Prophet Sallallahu was asked, where is taqwa? And he pointed towards his heart. He pointed towards his chest and his heart. And he said, taqwa ha huna, taqwa ha huna, taqwa ha huna. Remember, it is a state of mind. It is a condition of the heart. It is a condition of the soul. And it is a frame of mind. The frame of mind, remembering, remember that Allah is all knowing, Allah is all seeing, Allah is all hearing, and Allah is over you, supervising and observing all what you do. This feeling, this state of mind and this feeling in Allah Kana Alaikum Rikiba that I'm being washed by Asami Al Basir Al Khabir. This is a frame of taqwa and a frame of mind of a fear of Allah. How excellent fear of Allah is, and how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be fearful and mindful of Him. Has as it Anas radiallahu ta'ala and who has reported in Tarimzi that Prophet sallallahu said that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command the angels stationed at hell that whoever, whoever may have remembered him at any time or feared at any occasion should be taken out of hell. So this is the fear of Allah, which will take out, will be responsible for taking out of the inmates of hell from hell fire. Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Ibn Majah that Prophet sallallahu said, the tears that fall from the eyes of a truthful believer out of fear of the Lord, and then they roll down on his face, however little they are, even if they are at the size of the head of a fly, shall prevent the fire of the hell touching his face. And then Prophet sallallahu has told all of us that the two drops which are dearest to Allah, the two drops which are dearest to Allah, the first is the drop of tear coming out from the eyes of a bondsman when he cries out of the fear of Allah. And the second is the drop of blood of a bondsman martyred in the path of Allah. Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and who has reported that Prophet sallallahu said, when the hair of the bondsman stand on ends, owing to the fear of Lord, his sins fall away like leaves from an old sapless tree. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and who, and how she asked Prophet sallallahu that will there be certain 
certain lucky bondsmen who will enter the Jannah without any accountability. And Prophet Wasallam told her that all the people who used to cry out of the fear of Allah when they were all by themselves, people in solitude, when they were alone and they remembered Allah and they cried out of the fear of Allah, out of the fear of facing and standing in front of him, fearing about their sinful life, all these people who cried out of the fear of Allah, they will enter the Jannah without any accountability. And then easy accountability also for all those who used to cry out of the fear of Allah. And Hazrat Abu Huraira and who reports in Muslim and Bukhari that seven lucky people, when there will be no shade except the shade of the throne of Allah Azza wa Jal, the seven lucky people who will be allowed to stand or who will be allowed to come down under the under the shade of throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the lucky seven will be the person who, when he was all by himself, used to remember Allah and used to cry out of the fear of Allah, seeking forgiveness, crying out of the fear of Allah. <clears throat> seeking forgiveness and crying out of the fear of Allah will lead to easy accountability, will lead to entering into Jannah without accountability and question, will lead to being entered into the throne of, under the throne of Allah Azza wa Jal. And then Hazrat Abu Darda, uh, Abu Zar Ghaffari, ta'ala, who reports in Muslim Ahmad, the Prophet Sallallahu said, you as a person enjoy no superiority over a white-skinned or a black-skinned man. You can, of course, be excellent through piety and fear of Allah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has announced in Quran, inna akramakum indallahi atqaqum. All the worships lead to what? So that you become pious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hands us the Quran and says, In the Quran is guidance for only those who are what? They are God-fearing. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders about Hajj, Allah says, you take all your things with you, your necessities of life with you, but the best thing which you need to take for yourself for the travel of Hajj, for the days of Hajj is what? Is the fear of Allah. Is the fear of Allah. And then Salah also teaches us what? It teaches us Hashrain makes that what? Fearing of Allah. Humbly, humbly submitting to Allah because of the fear of Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announces in Quran that when you sacrifice animals for Allah, it is not the blood and the flesh which reaches Allah. It is the, it is the fear of Allah, the piety in your heart which reaches Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all the worships are treating, are training us for what? To be a, a self-controlling, God-fearing servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then... Hazrat Ma'az bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Musnad Ahmad the Prophet sallallahu said, much closer and dearer to me are the bondsmen who fear Allah and whoever they are and wherever they are. So this is how excellent and how, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us all to be God-fearing. And then Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala and who he narrates an occasion an incidence that once there was a young man who was at almost at the door of death and Prophet ﷺ asked him, in what state do you, you find yourself now? And the person replied that, O Messenger of Allah, I'm hopeful of divine mercy, but at the same time, there is a fear of punishment for my sins I have committed. And then Prophet ﷺ remarked that believe it, believe it, in whose hearts the two feelings of hope and fear are present at the time of death, Allah will surely grant him what he is confidently expecting from his mercy and keep him safe from the punishment he fears in his heart. So those who, who, who are fearing the torments of hellfire, who are, who are 
fearing the punishments of the day of judgment, who fear the accountability of the day of judgment, they will be eased out from all of these. And how the fear of Allah leads to expiation of all the sins. It has been reported by Hazrat Abu Huraira anhu in Muslim and Bukhari that Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he narrated an event. He said that there was a person of Bani Israel. He did great injustice to himself that he spent his life in folly and transgression. <clears throat> and when the hour of his death, it drew near, he was seized with fear of Allah because of life of negligence and evil doings he had led. And he was so fearful that he instructed his sons to burn his death body when he died and to scatter the ashes on the land or immerse some of them in the water. Why? Why did he do all that? So that there would be no traces for him anywhere and he would not be able to be resurrected on the day of recompense. And uh, then Prophet ﷺ said, by Allah, uh, all the sons, they did all that, that they burnt him and they, they dispersed off his ashes in the air and in the water. And he said that uh, uh, he told his sons that by Allah, I am such a sinner that if Lord gets hold of me, he will punish me like no one in the world. So his sons obeyed what he had ordered them to do. And then at the command of Allah, as Allah says in Quran, Kun fayakun, at the command of Allah, the remains of his body came together from the land and from the water, and he was resurrected and he was brought back to life. And Allah asked them, Allah asked him why he had asked his sons to burn him and to disperse his ashes. He said, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, I had done it only out of fear, out of fear of Allah. What happened with him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardoned him and all his sins were forgiven. So this is fear of Allah. And this is fear of accountability of Allah. And this is the excellence of fear of the torments of hellfire. How the companions feared Allah. Hazrat Abu Zarraz, Bafari radiallahu ta'ala and who he used to say, I wish I was a tree. I wish I was a tree. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her used to say, I wish I was a bird unknown. Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala and who used to say, I wish I was a blade of grass which had dried and winds had blown away. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who he cried at the time of death and he was crying and he was saying, that a long journey, an eternal long journey is starting and my provisions are very little. And my provisions are very little. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, little do we realize how much provisions we have made. Rabbi khair warham wa anta khairu rahimin. Hazrat Usman was Allahu ta'ala anhu. He used to cry, he used to cry and his beard used to get wet. And then, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who he used to cry, tears flowing down his cheeks had made lines and streaks on his face. And he used to cry and he used to say, I wish my mother had never given me birth. The taqwa of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who the fear of Allah in Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala's heart, it led him when he became a caliph, he would cry for the fear of accountability as a caliph. And he used to say that Umar, even if a dog dies of hunger, even if a dog dies of hunger in your rule on the bank of Tigris, then you will be held accountable. It was this fear. It was this fear of Allah, which, which he used to go about in the streets in night, disguised to find out the state of affairs of the people. And one night he heard a child cry there were children who were crying. He knocked at the door. A lady came down. And the lady, he asked, why would the children cry? Why were all the children crying? And the lady, very aggressively, she said, may Umar be ill-fated? He doesn't help us. Hazrat Umar, anhu, he immediately tried to justify and cover himself, obviously because he was disguised and the woman had not real recognized him. He immediately tried to justify himself and cover up. He said, he might not be aware of your condition, of the crisis you are facing. 
Then she was even more aggressive and she said very aggressively, may Umar be ill-fated. Why doesn't he try to find out about our conditions? He started trembling. He cried all the way back to the Baitul Mal. And then he carried a bag of flour over his back. The slave requested him to carry, let him carry it. But he said, you will carry my load in this world, but who will share it with me hereafter? He helped the woman cook, prepare the meal, feed the children, and then only he could sleep comfortably. Then there was another night. He heard a baby crying. A young infant, he heard them cry, uh, heard the baby cry, and he knocked at the door. And the woman came out, and she told him what the matter was. She told that Hazrat Umar, because again, she was not recognizing him as he was disguised. She said that Umar, the, prof, uh, the caliph, he has announced that when a mother stops lactating or nursing her baby, then she will be given a state scholarship for the provisions of the baby. And we are poor and we are needy. So desirous of availing of the scholarship for the baby, I have stopped lactating the baby today. Hazrat Umar who returned and he cried the whole night. He cried the whole night. And he was continuously saying, Umar, because of your faulty decision and announcement, you do not know how many babies might have been deprived of their right of lactation and being nursed. And in the morning, he got up and he made an amendment of, in his announcement of the state that all the babies being given scholarship the day they were born, if they were born to needy and poor families. So this was why this was because of the fear of Allah, the fear of accountability to Allah. And remember, Allah loves those who are pious, but the pious people also loves those who are pious. The people who fear Allah love those who fear Allah. Hazrat Umar who was again going around in the streets throughout the night till the time of dawn. And there was a time of milking of cows. And he passed by the house of a family who used to trade and sell their milk. And this was like the only source of their income. He overheard the mother instructing the daughter to add some water in the milk so that the milk would increase and they would be able to earn a few more coins. So the mother, when she instructed, the daughter said what? daughter said that mommy don't you know that the caliph has ordered that anyone who is going to do adulteration is going to be punished the mother immediately said that the caliph doesn't know the caliph is not seeing and hearing all this the daughter said that mommy caliph does not know and the caliph is not hearing but the caliph's god allah is all hearing and all seeing this fear that Allah knows and Allah sees and Allah hears is what taqwa is. As Umar ta'ala anhu, he was so impressed by the taqwa of this girl that he asked the slave to mark the house and remember the location. And in the morning, he called his son and he asked that was anyone desirous of getting married? Hazrat Salim, his son, he, uh, his wife had passed away and he said that he wanted to get married. And so for Hazrat Salim, Hazrat Umar who sent his slave as a message for nikah for Hazrat Salim. The son of Caliph, he is proposing not on the basis of riches, not on the basis of standards, but on the base of taqwa, on the base of taqwa, remember this choosing out a pious girl, a God-fearing girl led to what? She was the grandmother. She was the grandmother of Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Umar bin Abdul Aziz, who was what? Who was the caliph of the Umayyad dynasty and his period was the golden era of the Umayyad dynasty, but how fearing of Allah, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, what? How fearing of Allah, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, a great grandson of Hazrat Umar ta'ala and who was? He would, he would stay up late night doing his work. 
but he used to keep two lamps till when he would be working or doing the job of his state work he was doing. He used to use the lamp from which the oil of the state was being used. But when he started his own study or when he started reading for himself, he used to blow off this lamp and light his own lamp, the porcelain lamp, because fear of accountability, lest he may use the trust of the state for his personal job. This was out of the fear of Allah. One day he was sitting in his courtyard and he saw that uh, the maid was taking a cup of milk. The state guest house was neighboring the house of Hazrat Umar bin Abdul Aziz. And he saw that the maid was taking a cup of milk from the state guest house. She immediate, he immediately stopped her and he asked her that where was she taking this cup of milk from the state guest house? And the maid told uh, Hazrat Umar that his wife was pregnant and uh, she had a risk of abortion. So the medicine which has to be taken was to be taken with milk and she was getting the milk from the state guest house. Hazrat Umar bin Abdul Aziz asked her to stop, go back and return the milk because he said that I would prefer that this pregnancy gets aborted rather than getting giving birth to a child whose body was raised, whose body was raised consuming unlawful and forbidden food. This sensitivity for the lawful earning, for the trust was all due to what? Due to fear of Allah and due to taqwa. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us two supplications. One is extremely brief. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Memorize this and recite this frequently. And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to supplicate. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wal-tuqa wal-afafa wal-rina. And hellfire will be brought forth for the deviators. Allahumma ajirna min nar And it will be sent to them. Where are those you used to worship other than Allah? Can they help you or help themselves? So they will be overturned into hellfire. They and the deviators. Allahumma la tajalna minhum. And the soldiers of Iblis all together, they will say, while they dispute their end by Allah, we were indeed in manifest error when we equated you with the Lord of the worlds and no one misguided us except the criminals. So now we have no intercessors and not a devoted friend. Then we only had a return to the world and could be of the believers. Indeed, and that is a sign. But most of them were not believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is exalted in might and the merciful. The people of Nu alayhi salam denied the messengers. So from here, verse number 106 to 122, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to relate the story of Nuh alayhi salam. I will just be reading through it, but I will request all of you to go on revising the messages and the morals of the story which we learned in Surah Hud. When, uh, when the brother of Nu said to them, will you not fear Allah? You will, you will, rem uh, you will be going through in Surah Ashura repeatedly that all the prophets were asking their people to do what? To have piety, to, to be pious and to fear Allah. Indeed, I am to you a trustworthy messenger. So fear Allah and obey me. I do not ask you for it, any payment. My payment is only from the Lord of the world's. So fear Allah and obey me, they said, should we believe you while you are followed by the lowest class of people, he said, and what is my knowledge of what they used to do, their account is only upon my Lord, if you could perceive, and I am not one to drive away the believers, I am only a clear warner, they said, if you do not desist, oh no, you will surely be of those who are stoned, he said, my Lord, indeed, my people have denied me, then judge between me and them with decisive judgment and save me and those with me of believers. So we saved him and those with him 
in the laden ship. Then we drown them thereafter, who, who were not God-fearing. We drown them thereafter, the remaining ones. Indeed, in that is a sign, but most of them were not to be believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is exalted in might and merciful. Verse number 123 to 140, uh, 140, the story of the people of the Ad, again giving the same message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed all the nations when they became disbelievers and when they became transgressors and they did not fear Allah. Ad denied the messengers, and when their brother who sent to uh, said to them, "Will you not fear Allah? Indeed, I am to you a trustworthy messenger. So you do what you fear Allah." And yourself and take for yourself palaces and fortresses that you might abide eternally and when you strike you strike as tyrants so fear Allah and obey me and fear he who provided you with that which you know provided you with grazing livestock and children and gardens and spring indeed I fear for you the punishment of a terrible day they said the fearless transgressors said, it is all the same to us, whether you advise or are not of the advisors. This is not but the custom of the former people, and we are not to be punished. And they denied him. So we destroyed them who, who were not fearing Allah. Indeed, in that is a sign, but most of them were not to be believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is the exalted in might and merciful. Verse number 141 to 159, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining again the story of people of Samud and Hazar Swali. Samud, they denied the messenger when their brother Swali said to them, will you not fear Allah? Indeed, I am to you a trustworthy messenger. So fear Allah and obey me. I do not ask you for it any payment. My payment is only from the lords of the world. Will you be left in, uh, will you be left in what is here secure from death within gardens and springs and fields of crops and palm trees with softened fruits? And you come out of mountains, homes with skill. So fear Allah and obey me and do not obey the orders of the transgressors who cause corruption in land and do not amend. They said, the fearless transgressors, they said, you are only of those affected by magic. You are but a man like ourselves. So bring a sign if you should be of the truthful. He said, this is a she camel for her is a time of drink and for you is a time of drink each one on a known day. And do not touch her with harm, lest you be seized by the punishment of a terrible day. But they hamstrung her and so became regretful, and the punishment seized them. Indeed, in that is a sign, but most of them were not believers. And indeed, your Lord, he is exalted in might and merciful. <coughs> Verse number 160 to 175 is now the story of Hazrat Lut and his nation, how we invited them, but they still did not fear the day of resurrection and the torments of Allah. The people of Lut denied the messenger. When their brother Lut said to him, will you not fear Allah? Indeed, I am to you a trustworthy messenger. So fear Allah and obey me. I do not ask you for it any payment. My payment is only from the Lord of the worlds. Do you approach males among the worlds and leave what your Lord has created for you as mates? But you are people transgressing. They said, if you do not desist or loot, you will surely be of those evicted. He said, indeed, I am towards you. <clears throat> he said, indeed, I am towards your deed of those who detest it. My Lord, save me and my family from the consequences of what they do. So we saved him and his family all except an old woman among those who remained behind. 
then we destroyed the others and we rained upon them a rain of stones and evil was the rain of those who were warned indeed in that is a sign but most of them were not to be believers indeed your lord he is exalted in might and merciful Verse number 176 to 191. Now the story of people of Madian and Eka with Hazrat Shuaib salam. The companions of the thicket, they denied the messengers when Shuaib salam sent to them, said to them, will you not fear Allah? Indeed, I am to you a trustworthy messenger. So fear Allah and obey me. I do not ask you for it any payment. My payment is only from the Lord of the worlds. Give full measures and do not be of those who cause loss and weigh with an even balance and do not deprive people of their due and do not commit abuse on earth spreading corruption and fear he who created you and the former creations, they said. You are only of those affected by magic. You are but a man like ourselves. And indeed, we think you are among the liars. So cause to fall upon us. How fearless, how fearless. So cause to fall upon us, upon us, fragments of the sky, if you should be of the truthful. He said, my Lord is most knowing of what you do. And they denied him. So the punishments of the day of the black cloud seized them. Indeed, it was the punishment of a terrible day. Indeed, in that is a sign. But most of them were not to be believers and indeed your lord he is exalted in might and merciful verse number 192 and indeed the quran is the revolution of the laws of the world the trustworthy spirit has brought it down so now after narrating historical events of the tormented nations allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning now that prophet sallallahu has been blessed by quran to invite towards the prophethood and to invite towards all what the previous nations were invited to to warn the people prophet sallallahu is inviting and to warn them of the severe punishments upon your heart so has it ibrahim the trustworthy spirit has brought out the Quran where upon your heart that you may be of the warners in a clear Arabic language. And indeed it is mentioned in the scriptures of the former people. And has it not been assigned to them that it is recognized by the scholars of the children of Israel. And even if we had revealed it to one among the foreigners he had recited it to them perfectly they would still have not been believers in it thus have we inserted disbelief into the hearts of the criminals they will not believe in it until they see the painful punishment and it will come to them suddenly while they perceive it not and they will say may we be reprieved so for our punishment are they impatient then have you considered if we give them enjoyment for years and then there came to them that which they were promised, they will not be availed by the enjoyment which they were provided with. And we did not destroy any city except that it had warners as reminder and never have we been unjust. unjust. And the devils have not brought the revelation down. It is not allowed for them, nor would they be able. Indeed, they from its hearing are removed. So do not invoke with Allah another deity and thus be among the punished. Verse 214, and warn your closest kindred. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is ordering Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet ﷺ has been ordered to invite his near and dear ones. And once he was ordered, there is no order of Quran to which he did not show obedience. So he obeyed and he started his invitation. He invited his relatives and his tribesmen to a mount and he stood up the mount and he called up to them. And when all of them had gathered, he asked them that if I tell you that there is an army behind the mountains preparing to attack you, will you believe me? 
Will you believe me? With a consensus of opinion, all of them said this, yes, you are the Asadik al-Amin, the truthful and the trustworthy, and we take you for your word. Then establishing and establishing his uh, reliability and reconfirming his reliability, he started inviting them. He inviting them to faith on oneness of Allah and to abolish all the 360 idols which they had set in in Kaaba. So what happened there was that Abu Lahab, his uncle, he picked up and he threw a handful of pebbles towards Prophet Sallallahu saying, Tabbalak, that may, be, may you be, Nauzubillah, you may be destroyed. And for this, the verses of Surah Lahab were, uh, they were revealed to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And uh, the same uh, fate was announced for Abu Lahab himself, that he said, destruction for you. And then Prophet Sallallahu not only in this occasion, in another occasion, he invited all his relatives and relatives of kin at his own place. Like there he um, called out to his maternal aunt, Hazrat Safiya, radiallahu ta'ala anha, and he said, Ya Safiya, inqizi nafsiki minan nar, fa inni la amdaku min Allahi shayya, that O oh, Safiya, save yourself from hellfire, that I can do all. What I can do is just warn you from the hellfire and the punishments of hellfire, but I will not be able to save you on the day of judgment from the hellfire. So for all of us, so for all of us, we learn a basic message is that while inviting towards Allah, it is an order of Allah. Order of Allah is to invite towards Allah. It is a commandment of Allah. It is an order of Allah. It is obligatory for all of us. As Allah says in Quran, بَلِّغْ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ It is just our duty to what? To invite people towards Allah. And then Prophet Sallallahu himself he ordered on the sermon of the farewell pilgrimage, he said, that all people who are present here, they will pass on this message to those who are absent, who are absent from this gathering. And then after saying these words, he raised his hands and he supplicated, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may you keep that person fresh and may you keep that person happy and contented and peaceful who learns from me and passes it on to others. So remember, it is an order of Allah. It is a commandment of the Quran. It is obligatory for all of us. And it is a sunnah of Prophet ﷺ. And it is an order of Prophet ﷺ also to invite others towards the teachings of Quran, the teaching, the preaching and implementing of Quran is what obligatory for all of us. But when we start inviting we need to start from the inner circle. From the inner circle, as we learn from this verse 214, from our relatives. And remember, this is the most difficult of invitations. The most difficult of invitations is inviting our own relatives and relations of kin. Why? Because our near and dear ones, they know us in and out. They know us in and out, but when we are inviting the outsiders, we may invite and we may teach and we may preach despite not doing all those things ourselves. And no one would know and none of them will criticize and they will take and they will hear all that from us. But when we are inviting our own family members and relatives, they will neither listen nor accept it if we are not if we are not practicing all what we are preaching. And moreover, we will also have to, we will have to face an open house criticism also. So inviting our relationships is mandatory. It is important, although it is very difficult. But at the same time, we also need to remember another thing that when we invite our relatives and relations of kin and they do not accept and they do not respond, then what do we need to do is that we should not stop inviting others. Just thinking or assuming that the outsiders, they might just criticize us saying that her own daughter or her own sister or her own brother, she doesn't accept or they don't accept. 
So then why and how does she go about telling others? Her own family members are not accepting what she's telling. So if they have not accepted, so why does she go about telling others? People might just point out that she has not been able to bring a change around herself. Then why does she go, go about telling beyond her inner circle? Remember, there is the model of Hazrat Nuh alayhi salam. His own wife, his son, they had not believed. But still, he kept on inviting for like 950 years to all those other than his own family. Hazrat Nuh alayhi salam. His wife was disobedient. She was a transgressor. But still, he kept on inviting others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us and protect us and accept from us our tiny efforts. And so Prophet Sallallahu was ordered to invite all those who were his close relatives and said, and lower your wings to those who follow you of the believers. And if they disobey you, then say, indeed, I am disassociated from what you are doing and rely upon the exalted in might and peace and merciful who sees you, who sees you when you arise and your movements among those who prostrate. Indeed, he is the hearing and the knowing. Shall I inform upon you whom the devils descend? They descend upon every sinful liar. They pass on what is heard, and most of them are liars. <coughs> and one of them are whom? Are the poets. And the poets, only the deviators follow them. Do you not see that in every valley they roam about? So here in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the poets and the concept of poetry in Islam. Allah says that people who follow and accompany the poets are wholly diff different people. They differ in their habits and their temperaments from those who follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So people following the poets are misguided and people who are guided are those who follow Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because, you know, poets are following what? They follow no fixed patterns for their thoughts and speech. And they, as Allah is saying here, they wander aimlessly in all forms of different spheres of life and different uh, uh, valleys of the different valleys of uh, the life. And as Allah uh, has told us about Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah says, wa ma shi'ra wa ma lahu, That we have not taught him poetry, nor does it suit him. This is Surah Yaseen, verse number 69, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told the condition of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there's an authentic tradition which says that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could not recite a complete verse from his memory. And he would recite it without much care and regard for its meter and order of words also. And once Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and she was asked whether the Prophet وسلم, used to make use of poetic verses when he was addressing the people. And she replied that he disliked poetic verse the most. He disliked the poetic verses the most. And um, although when sometimes he would recite a verse of a poet of uh, Bani Kes, but in doing so, he would unconsciously change the order of the words. And when Hazrat Abu Bakr, Razi Allah, and who he corrected him, he would say, brother, I'm not a poet and I'm not composing poetry and poetry, composing poetry is not my object. And Arabic poetry we learn, and similar to the poetry of like basically of all the languages, they have themes of sex and love and romance and wine and drinking and tribal hatreds and feuds, and also sometimes ancestral pride and vanity. And all forms of, generally all forms of poetry, it makes a very little mention of pure and noble themes also. So uh, basically, poetries are generally saturated with falsehood and exaggeration and false accusations and undue praises and vanity or jesting or uh, polytheist concepts. Or somehow the Arabs also used to make mock Prophet in his in their poets uh, in their poetries also. So uh, it is better 
Professor Lavalisam has been reported to say that it is better that the interior of one of you, that is interior means what? That is one of your bellies. It becomes swilled up with pus than with poetry verses. So uh, some verses, uh, Prophet Sallallahu has been reported to say that some verses are based on, on wisdom. So Prophet Sallallahu we do learn that he heard the verses of um, Umayya bin Abi Salf. And he said that his verses are believers, but his heart is a disbeliever. And uh, there was an occasion when a companion recited almost a hundred or so good verses before him, and he was urging him to recite more. And then uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's uh, poet, Hazrat Hassan bin Sabit, Allahu ta'ala anhu, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to ask him to recite poetry against the people of Quraysh, and uh, again, for their dishonor and for their disrespect. So poetry generally, which is used in the purposes which I've explained already, is not uh, liked. In fact, is highly disliked by Allah and by his Prophet Wasallam. But poets uh, who write poetry for national concepts or for creating awareness or for promoting good ethics and good manners can obviously be used and they can be connected with. And that they say what they do not know, except those poets who believe and do righteous deeds and remember Allah often and defend the Muslims after they were wronged. And those who have wronged are going to know to what kind of return they will be returned. Allahumma ihtina sirat al mustaqeen. Allahumma arina al haqqa haqqan warzukna tiba'a. Allahumma arina al batila batila warzukna jtinaba. Ameen summa ameen.